lot of people probably assume that .NET started with this grand strategy, you know, carefully thought out and had all planned out. And you know, in many ways, .NET started uh, kind of as just a couple of us, you know, trying out ideas. At the time, we knew we needed some kind of programming environment uh, that really made it easy to write code. And and that's what we tried to do with with uh, with .NET. Just like make the leap and build a new platform. A bunch of us kind of came together and and realized, hey, there's something big there and a big opportunity. We all went off and wrote one pagers in Word. This is what it would kind of look like. And then we went in and typed in the code. When you have a continuous process like that, you can, you can capture good ideas when they happen. And no one had a clue it was coming. But we all know that this is gonna change programmers' lives. This really is a state-of-the-art technology offering the very highest levels of performance. I think you know, by the time we got out to the PDC in the year 2000, when we introduced everything for the first time, that was validated in a big way you know, by our developer base. It was just a lot of fun being there and, and, and popping that one on, on a big audience. It was a big surprise to everyone. The thing was, we also gave uh, uh, developers bits to work with. Here's the bits. So people walked out of there with stuff they could put on their machine and actually see that it was real. That was one of the highlights for my career, was just watching the audience get into it. But that was sort of the big coming out party for .NET. But the final version came out in 2002. And welcome to the unveiling of Visual Studio .NET. And it's, it's been a pretty solid ramp up uh, ever, ever since. Never quite expected it to turn out like it did. Effective today, we are open sourcing the entire Roslyn project. Roslyn is now open source. We're actually announcing a new .NET foundation that we're going to use as kind of the umbrella for how all these projects get contributed. We're smashing universes together. We launched .NET Core 1.0 this morning. You pick any Fortune 1000 company and then they will use some of our stuff. It's a testament to all the great work that this team does. .NET 6 is a unified platform. That's one SDK, one runtime, one set of base libraries. .NET can literally be anywhere you need it to be. We have been the most loved framework for three years in a row. I'm going to show you how easy it is to get started. This whole industry was built on constant innovation. We're passionate around the product and hopefully that passion translates into building a better product. It's what fuels the, everything we do is this relentless push to make it better, more functional, you know, build new form factors, merge different technologies. I'm glad that our system is making it easier for people to write code today. Is that your stomach? Hello, welcome to the .NET 20th anniversary stream. It is so exciting to have you all watching. This is a huge milestone, 20 years. When does that happen? We, we work in tech, that's incredible. So this whole event, we have a hashtag .NET loves me. Please, please share your stories. I absolutely love seeing the code um, of everything people are building today with .NET. Absolutely amazing innovations and businesses and everything that's happening. We have some really cool things prepared for the stream today. We've got videos, we've got stories, we've got some guests and Speaking of our guests, I'll go ahead and introduce you. Uh, we have Scott Hunter and Scott Hansman here in the studio. They've been building .NET for the last 15 years. Pivotal moments, big changes. Thank you guys for being here today. Hey, friends. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, yeah, 20 years. Uh, we've been here working together now for 15. But uh, how did you start, actually? It's, it's kind of crazy. <clears throat> uh, before I was a .NET programmer, I was a C++ programmer using Visual Studio 6.0. Yeah, um, I actually did Visual Basic 3, and then I was doing C++, and then I did VB6, and then Visual Basic .NET happened, and it just seemed like a natural next step for me. So .NET kind of flowed from my work on Visual Basic. To me, it was the object-oriented C++, and then the classic ASP, kind of the two things that brought me together. But something weird, <clears throat> Scott and I both, we were at the PDC where .NET was released mm -hmm. announced. Yeah, we didn't know each other, though. We were just sitting several rows apart from Who each other. Who knows where we were in the, in the room, but I remember being there, watching the, the release of, of, of .NET, and grabbing the disks, mm -hmm. uh, running back to my hotel room, shoving them all on my laptop, uh, which was, they were big back in the day, and uh, building my first .NET program. Yeah, and I actually used Visual Studio .NET. This is when we put the .NET at the end of everything here. And uh, for me, it was really .NET 1.1 was where I really kind of like 
found my stride. And I worked on large banking systems, retail online banking that were originally in COM and DCOM and C++. And then there was a bridge between those two things. And that's been a, a theme throughout .NET is providing bridges to different technologies. And uh, even now, some systems are still built on this. Uh, I, I had that same bridge. We were, I was building, uh, I was in the oil industry, and we were building some, some software. It was all C++ and COM based. And I wrote the code where you could inject .NET components into that uh, to slowly replace the C++ components. But the bridge to me was, I was a desktop developer, but when ASP.NET came out, it made it very easy for the same concepts that a desktop developer would have, controls, mm -hmm. uh, worked in ASP.NET. And so I started moving from the desktop to the web a little bit, because in our world, you know, installing that application on hundreds of desktops was a lot of work. Uh, but a website, anybody could hit without any installation on their machine. And so it was a bridge to me from the desktop to web with ASP.NET. Uh, and speaking of bridges, I've, I've got this blog that I've been running for the last 20 years uh, before I was at Microsoft, and it's on some software called DOS Blog, which is German for the blog. And it was written by Clemens Vasters, who works on Azure, and then Omar Shaheen, who works in OneDrive now, and I uh, took it over from Clemens. And then Mark Downey, who works in the Visual Studio team, recently converted it to .NET Core 6. So this software is 17, 18 years old and has been updated. And it's gone from .NET 1 to 2 to 4 and now .NET 6. And I'm now running it in a container in Azure on Linux. And it's, it's largely the same code base, which is really totally amazing. Totally modernized. Use all the newest tech, though. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we're still actively working on it. That, uh, that app application I talked about mm -hmm. 20 years ago, it is still being used today. Um, so it's cool that um, all that tech we wrote 20 years ago works great today. But you can also modernize and use all the new tech we're shipping with .NET 6 today as well. Yeah, for, for .NET to still allow me to go and run my blog uh, software, all the same back end on, uh, on Linux has been huge for me. And also, uh, I can run it with WSL on Windows. So I do my building in Visual Studio on Windows. I target Linux, and I put it up into the cloud, and it, it just works great. And <clears throat> today, if you want, you can also build on a Mac. Mm -hmm. You can build on a Linux device. Yep. Uh, you know, that .NET was only Windows, and now we are Windows, Mac, uh, Linux. We are Raspberry Pi. Cross-platform. iPhone, Android. Uh, every device you can think of, um, all the things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you run it everywhere, exactly. So you both started as part of the community, right? You were in the same conference. How much has the community impacted .NET through these pivotal moments? You know, I was doing, so I was working at these banks and I was doing open source on an application, uh, on a, a library that was called Log4Net. And uh, there was a bug in Log4Net around the rolling file appender and I fixed it. And this was on SourceForge and we used CVS. And that was my first kind of taste of open source was introducing .NET to these large banks and having to run an open source thing at a bank, which was a big deal at the time. To me, my first community aspect is going to sound different. Scott Guthrie had a blog. And he was an active blogger on .NET. Oh, and yeah. this was a point in time when Microsoft didn't really talk about their, their products very much. It was kind of hidden behind the scenes. There'd be a new version that would show up. But Scott had this transparent blog that talked about all the new things that were going to come in .NET. And uh, I read that blog, which then led me to Brad Abrams' blog. Uh, and that's how I got into Microsoft, actually. I was actually reading Brad's blog. And he's like, hey, we need somebody to come work on this ASP.NET technology. And I'm like, sign me up. You know, I actually met Scott Guthrie at a conference, at a party in, uh, in the Bay Area, and uh, he was talking to me about this .NET model view controller thing that they were going to do, and they said, you know, maybe we're going to do it open source. And he knew I was working in open source, and he seemed like a nice fella. So I ended up <laughs> coming to work here, and that, that was when we started thinking about really open sourcing stuff for real. Um, but the community has grown up so much with us. I mean, as I look at the journey uh, from .NET Framework to .NET Core, um, we actually developed a lot of that product live in the community. Uh, if you remember the what it was called, the ASP.NET uh, stand-up. Mm -hmm. Oh, the community um, stand-up? It was the community stand-up. And we literally would, would, as we were prototyping what becomes .NET Core in the future, every week we'd get on, on, on a video, show what we're working on, and that product was actually built through community all the way through. I mean, you look at the, the performance improvements that we made in .NET from the community. Uh, community is such a big part of .NET today, and, and uh, I don't think I appreciated it as much back, 
back then as I do today. Yeah, uh, design meetings for the C-sharp language being filmed uh, publicly. Just basically we would turn on the camera and say, look, we're in the kitchen. We're deciding what's going to be on the menu. Let's go and do it in public. And that really wasn't done uh, in the early days of Microsoft. E even you and I on stage at things like Build and stuff like that, we were more transparent about the product than most Microsoft teams would have been at the time. We're, we're talking about the one ASP.NET dialogues and the changes we're going to make and stuff like that. That was not the style of, of development back then. Yeah, and I like that it hopefully it sets the tone for most of people's relationships with Microsoft, and we see that now with things like Terminal and WSL. Thank you guys so much for sharing. I'm absolutely loving all of the tweets and fun stuff coming in. We've got a .NET bot mouse pad, very cool. And speaking of Scott Hunt or Scott Guthrie, sorry, different Scott. Scott Guthrie, uh, we do have a special message from him all about community. Scott Guthrie was one of the lead inventors of .NET, and uh, so now he has a message, and now he is the corporate vice president of Azure and AI. So I guess we should see what he has to say. It's hard to believe that uh, .NET version 1.0 shipped 20 years ago, and what better way to celebrate the 20th anniversary of .NET uh, than on Valentine's Day? Uh, you know, as I reflect back on the last 20 years, uh, it's been an amazing ride. And, um, you know, the thing that's endured throughout it and which first really comes to mind for me is just gratitude for this developer community. Um, you know, you've been there since the beginning and uh, have helped support us and give us feedback and really made .NET what it is over the last 20 years. And all of us at Microsoft can't really thank you enough uh, for everything you've done and everything you've contributed, uh, both to .NET and, and to bringing in more and more developers over the years to take advantage of it in lots of different ways. You know, 20 years ago, the idea of, you know, building a common language runtime that can support multiple languages uh, with a consistent set of libraries and APIs that could be used to build all types of applications um, you know, it was, was still pretty radical. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of amazing looking at how we've, you know, evolved since that time over the last 20 years uh, in, in lots of new ways and then opening up new scenarios and taking what was at the time, you know, designed for the internet, which was still relatively new back then, uh, and evolving it to cloud and distributed systems and um, AI and a whole bunch of new scenarios that, you know, I think, you know, uh, just didn't exist even 20 years ago. Um, you know, .NET started off as a very a platform that only worked on Windows and uh, really only supported one developer tool and was closed source. And, you know, in 2012, we open sourced ASP.NET and then in 2014, open sourced, you know, the common language runtime and all the core libraries and made it multi-platform. And again, this community was critical to giving us that feedback and helping us through that journey as we kind of transition. And it's sort of remarkable today, the fact that you can use .NET on every major OS. Uh, you can even run a version of it on an iPhone or an Android device. Uh, and um, uh, it's open source with literally thousands of contributors around the world. And um, yeah, as I look ahead to the future, I continue to be even more excited about what's gonna happen in the years ahead. Uh, we just released .NET 6 in November of 2021, so only a few months ago, and we're full speed ahead on building .NET 7. And you know, with each new release of growth, uh, we continue to kind of attract new developers, uh, a new generation of uh, people that are given feedback and are pushing .NET in new ways. And I'm incredibly excited about what the next 20 years uh, has to bring. So thank you everyone in this community for all that you've done um, and for really shaping the platform for what it is today. And uh, look forward to working with you more in the future. And I think our, our best days are still ahead of us. And um, thanks again and have a great event. So good. So next I wanna talk with Scott Hunter and Scott Hanselin about how teams at Microsoft are using .NET to, you know, power our most critical businesses. We got Azure, we got Bing. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's one of the most amazing aspects of .NET is, you know, we're building a product for you, uh, but we're running it at huge scale at Microsoft. And so we have the Azure Active Directory Gateway, 
which handles all these AAD requests, uh, taking billions of requests a second, uh, all running .NET. Um, if you're using things like Dynamics 365 or Azure App Service, the proxy that sits in front of those things is actually written in .NET as well. And so .NET is running and scaling all those applications. And as Kendra said, you know Bing. Bing.com is powered by .NET as well. So that's a couple of those examples of amazing sites run by .NET. And actually, speaking of transparency that we <coughs> mentioned before, you can find some really great blog posts about Bing uh, and seeing specifically, like, here's where we installed .NET 5, and then we see latency go down, we see throughput go up, all done very transparently. Uh, big thanks to the Bing team. <coughs> Many of these services and sites, when they move to .NET, uh, from .NET Framework to like .NET 6 or .NET 5, they're seeing, as you said, performance improves by half, by double. Yeah. Double the performance, half the CPU used. It's amazing. Yeah. And I, I'm a big fan of how, what Xbox does with .NET. You know, Xbox has been thinking about .NET since the early days. If you look at uh, whether it be uh, Unity, which, in C, which uses C++ at its heart, so a lot of games that you have been, uh, been, been using have C Sharp and .NET at their heart. But on the server side, things like the Halo leaderboard and you know, the things that scale large, large systems and multiplayer systems like that. And then uh, actor models like Project Orleans uh, using uh, .NET um, to make systems at huge scale, tens of millions of users and things like that, which are really and, and we just recently took Orleans and moved it into the .NET team. Mm -hmm. And so I think you might see, starting in .NET 7 and beyond, us taking that actor framework and making a, a bigger part of the .NET story. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the benchmarks that we see with .NET are always impressive. The, the Tech Empower benchmark is, it's a, it's a culture. We changed our culture years ago. Um, there was, a true story is, um, we were, Scott Guthrie gets an email from a customer that tried to run our tech on the Tech Empower benchmark. Uh, and that benchmark was actually a Linux benchmark. And there was no .NET for Linux at the time. So it was running on Mono. Uh, but we got that information. Um, and the whole team got together and said, let's go focus on this. And .NET Core 1 was the first one that uh, started showing up in the tops mm -hmm. of some of those, those benchmarks. .NET 6, huge upgrade in uh, Entity Framework core performance. Uh, so every release has one thing that gets a, a lot faster. Yeah, and now we have this wonderful kind of fun thumb war as we go around in the top 10 with other frameworks, this kind of fun coopetition as we learn more about performance. And ultimately, we're pushing the limits of uh, the laws of physics right now in Perf. I think Kendra is waving at us here. <laughs> well, I want to hear exactly right from the teams at Microsoft. So we have some more videos. I'm loving all of the tweets that are coming up, though. We have some stickers. We have some t-shirts. So much fun. Visual Basic 2005. So cool. Um, so next, we have a video from teams at Microsoft that are all about using .NET to power their critical businesses, as we said. So we're going to hear from Bing, Dynamics 365, and Azure. Customers everywhere have used .NET. From beloved burrito chains to prestigious film academies to medical associations making life-saving discoveries. These organizations are getting game-changing results from .NET's performance, flexibility, and seamless development experience. But don't take our word for it. Let's hear it from them. The Worldwide Telescope is a software tool that is a personal portal to our solar system and to the universe beyond. Worldwide Telescope was built with .NET. Data sets are sent into the cloud in Azure. Developers have the chance to find new ways to express to us through this software. Broadcasters today are very excited about where virtual reality can really take their content. We've been using Microsoft pretty heavily for our backend video streaming architecture. Everything we're building here at LiveLike is stuff nobody's really worked on before. Our volunteers did not like our older apps. We needed to change everything. .NET Core is fully compatible with all of the open source technology we use. We will end the pain and suffering caused by cancer in different ways, the app being one of them. Digitalization and the networking between healthcare providers and software development companies is essential to value-based care. I love Kubernetes. You have a very short way from coding into actual operation of your code. I'm really proud of working for this project because it really can make a change to the healthcare industry. .NET Core 3.0 has allowed us to build a much faster application and get information to our users faster than before. 
With .NET Core 3.0, we can build the app and run it on our Windows developers' machines, our designers with Macs, and Enterprise in the Cloud on Linux, and build it one way. And that's tremendous. Coke is a company that is all about their brand, and Xamarin has allowed us to present it in the best way possible. If it's good enough for Coke, it's probably good enough for whatever project they're working on. At ASOS, our mission is to be the number one fashion destination for 20-somethings globally. The Azure products play a massive role, not just in preparing and, and executing on Black Friday, but also throughout the entire year. We were a big .NET Microsoft shop. We're very focused on doing the best we can by the membership, making sure that what we produce is beautiful, powerful, secure, usable, and highly available. There are a lot of technical challenges when it comes to building a platform that is going to host so many important documents for people. With Blazor, it gave us the opportunity to have both the front end and the back end done by the same people. We're able to get web applications that are written in C Sharp. It used to take us so much more code to write. It's amazing. Hearing these stories, one thing's certain. .NET has empowered companies to work faster, build stronger businesses, and develop for the future. Let's see what you can do. So. There we go. So I did swap the videos, actually. That was all about enterprises and startups outside of Microsoft relying on .NET. We will show you what Microsoft internal engineering teams are using. So they're not on the .NET team, but they are inside of Microsoft. And they do rely on .NET to power some of their businesses. Let's roll that one, if we can. <laughs> The workflow for Bing.com is tens of thousands of nodes. It's one of our largest. And we have to execute that with low latency, with minimal overhead. When we migrated from .NET Framework to .NET 5, on day one, we saw a 14% drop in latency. That translates into less processing overhead, more queries we can execute. And for that, .NET is invaluable. And we have hundreds of developers checking in code so that when you do a search on Bing, we render that UI that you see. Our platform is built on .NET. Every version, it keeps getting faster. The performance gets better, and not only that, but it's also open source. And now that it's on GitHub, there's people contributing it, just from the community even, that make it better. That saves us work. AppService is a platform where customers can run their web applications or function applications on Azure Cloud. A good amount of our platform infrastructure code is built on .NET. The biggest benefit is the engineering agility. Three years ago, when we were in a position where customers said, hey, I want to customize my Cypher suite for my web app, we were struggling to solve these problems. Frankly speaking, very few people in this world can code in uh, C++, but when you look at the C Sharp audience, like tons of people can code this, write this. When we look at .NET, all these extensibility points were already there. We're in the process of revamping all of our front ends. We're replacing IIS code and custom-built modules that were using unmanaged code. When you're writing unmanaged code, you need to worry about your garbage collection or how much memory you're allocating. When you translate over to .NET and manage code, you have the garbage collector that is done automatically for you. Having the protection of writing in managed code is something that helps us a lot. Dynamics is a multi-billion dollar business for low code, no code solution. Our scale right now is 100 billions of requests a month with over seven petabyte of data being transferred. We used to use the open source project Ocelot, but we wanted to create a gateway that powers our product at scale. We found this as a great opportunity to collaborate with the .NET Core team on an open source project called YARP. The gateway implementation that we have built on top of .NET, leveraging YARP, enables us to customize the way we integrate our traffic ingress solution with the topology of our clusters that are constantly changing. If one machine were to fail, 
for whatever reason. Those events are very rare, but they always happen when you're operating at the scale that we operate in. And so having a solution that allows us to react to those events in real time and maintain availability of the service, that is critical. It's our bread and butter. Like if .NET didn't exist, I don't know uh, how we will even code our service. Being able to manage such a huge engineering fleet, .NET makes that a lot easier for us. Our journey on .NET has really been a productive one and, and we've been able to, to get a lot out of it. Cool to hear those stories. So one thing I want to call out, we do have digital swag for this event. There's wallpapers that you can download and just cool, fun stuff. Go to .net.microsoft.com to grab that. And now I want to pass it back to the Scots that we have in the room. And I want to talk about the .NET 6 release. What are we seeing? What are we excited about? So for me, my, my favorite feature in .NET 6 is going to be hot reload. So we've talked about performance already. Uh, Anytime you have a compiled language, whether it's like C++ or Java or .NET, they typically end up, end up being higher performance, but they have to be compiled. And so they're slower, the inner loop, the time to make a change in your code and to have that change actually take effect is slower. And so with Hot Reload, we don't have to recompile when you make a change. And so it gives us the ability to say you get the performance of .NET, but you get the inner loop or the, or the design time performance that you would see with a non-compiled language like JavaScript or Python. Uh, so that's one of my favorite features in, in .NET 6. And that major feature ties into Visual Studio 2022 as well, because it's so much based on your tooling and your debug loop. And testing itself can be hot reloaded. If you check the, the checkbox and hot reload your test, you can avoid builds in between runs. Super cool. And it even works for .NET Framework. So it, it goes beyond just the newer .NET 6. It actually works in .NET Framework as well. Yeah. And we've really seen .NET 6 uh, be adopted uh, you know, faster than ever before. We've seen over 1.5 million downloads of the .NET 6 SDK. Uh, and then if you count the .NET 6 runtime as well in that, you've got over 3 million downloads. And that's just on .NET 6, which came out a couple months ago. Just, just the first week of November. Yeah, absolutely. And right now we've got over 5 million uh, active users. Active users are people who are actively inside of Visual Studio uh, in the Visual Studio family. So over 5 million folks are doing that, which is pretty fantastic. 5 million? So who are these people using .NET? Who are these who people? Are so they? so that's, that's one of the coolest things is, you know, .NET's been around for 20 years. We do a survey when you download .NET, and we ask, you know, who are you and why are you choosing .NET? 75% of those people are new to .NET, and many of them are students. And so we're attracting a brand new audience to .NET. I think it's because of this cross-platform, command line first, open source uh, strategy that we have with .NET. It's opening it up to a whole new group of people. Yep. Um, I'm actually, uh, my team's working on a .NET education pack at uh, dot .NET slash learn to code, where you can get Visual Studio, .NET, and an exciting notebook and learn all about .NET right there. So yes, great for new developers to start with C Sharp and .NET. And one more thing that people might be, be stunned to hear is, you know, we have huge partnerships with things like Red Hat. Um, so we actually shipped the first version of .NET Core um, at a Red Hat developer conference, mm -hmm. uh, just showing how .NET is open in, in, in new environments that we never were in before. Yep, runs everywhere. Very cool. So we want to hear from another story. We mentioned students are a huge, huge deal coming into the .NET community. So I want to hear from uh, our next video is of Alex Dunn. He created an accessibility assistant for Minecraft for his brother. And now schools are using it to teach students with disabilities how to code. So Alex Dunn is one of our Microsoft MVPs and open source contributors. Let's roll it. On a residential street, a young couple walk a Labrador mix on a leash. Alex is just a caring individual. He's always looking out for those around him, whether human or dog. <laughs> Alex Dunn, Voiceify. My wife and I both volunteer with different rescue groups. We specialize in difficult dogs with either behavioral issues or health issues. Kenzie Whalen. He finds a lot of drive from wanting to help people who are struggling in any capacity. My little brother, he's 15 or so years younger than me. He lives with a number of disabilities from autism to heart conditions. He lives with my parents very far away. The best way that we could bond together was playing online games like Minecraft. On a screen. He can do it. It's just a little bit slower. He has to take things one at a time. He gets very frustrated very quickly, no longer wants to play the game. That was just like pretty upsetting. So, I mean, I started 
down the route of like, well, what if I could build an assistant that helps play the game for you? A diagram. What if I could just say what I wanted it to do? I had had years of experience in voice AI and automatic speech recognition and natural language understanding. Once I had the first prototype version of voice input, I immediately went to, okay, well, what else can be used? The original prototypes of Enabled Play used Azure Cognitive Services for normal speech recognition and image recognition and computer vision. I'm also using Azure App Service with an ASP.NET Core backend for API and, and SignalR for real-time communication to devices. So now you're using your face, your hands, your body position, and your voice, and any other input you might have can be all done at the same time. Bryce Johnson. I'm really interested to dive into what you've been doing. I originally met Bryce sort of virtually. He was super receptive to me throwing all my ideas at him. Talk to me about latency. Shoot. In Halo. The first technical challenge that I ran into was latency issues with voice. You record a snippet of audio, you send that to do the speech recognition, and then map it to an input, and it needs to be done on a cloud server, then sent to the actual device to run the input. I overcame that focusing on predictive and personalized offline models. So we went from that sort of like one second total turnaround to under 30 milliseconds per request. A Minecraft cursor. Stop. A cursor stops. Build up. Nick Laidlaw. There's certainly innate bias in voice technology. Enabled Play allows users with all different varying speech capabilities to be able to train the models based off of how they speak. A climbing cow. The same thing goes for gesture. If you can use your facial expression or body position or, or your hands, then you can add all of those things together and basically create this truly personal profile for how you communicate to your computers. It opens up the playing field for anyone to start to interface with devices. When I met Alex, he was on the cusp of 18, hadn't gone through college. He was self-taught. I learned a lot from just actually working through the different GitHub repositories, especially since Microsoft open sourced basically everything in the .NET world, from .NET Framework to .NET Core and, and now .NET 6 uh, on multi-platform using Azure services enabled me to automate very easily from just using Visual Studio to write my C Sharp code to automating deployments using Azure DevOps to my Azure app services to being able to handle automated updates against my firmware using the IoT pipelines from Azure. It's allowed me as a single developer to manage a project that is such a large scale. When Alex's brother got the new modified controller, he was able to play with Alex on a level playing field for the first time. It almost brings me to tears. It is very emotional. I've seen that you're um, thinking about this beyond gaming. I think I saw you were talking to a school board. Yeah. Cindy Chang. We don't have a system whereby our students with certain disabilities, differing abilities, can contribute to the development of computer programming projects. A video call. I was really fortunate to meet Alex. I was blown away that by movement of the head, they could put out a block of code. A classroom. And we're gonna try to pilot this to explore our options because computer science education is for all students. No one gets left behind. Working with someone like Alex has been a real joy, just watching him grow and develop. Alex has all the tools to make huge, huge impact, and I'm really excited to be part of it. Alex and Kenzie walk their dog. Microsoft Azure, Microsoft. So cool, I love hearing these stories. Uh, so next with us, we're, we're at the table now by the tag board, we have David Fowler, hey. one of the lead .NET architects here to talk about Exciting stuff. So you've been here for quite a long time. I want to hear what was the technological challenge in early days of .NET, Project K days? The biggest thing I think was the scoping. The, the project was so big, we tried to replace the entire, the entire thing um, at the same time. We're doing the, the product system, we're trying to do the tooling, the runtime, we're changing the entire stack all at once. Right? Yeah. And that was a, 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 big a, big a big hard thing for us to, to do. We didn't even have a runtime because one of our goals with Project K was to be cross-platform. Cross -platform. Right? Yep. And we didn't have a .NET that ran cross-platform, so we had to actually work on Mono, yep. which is an open source project, an open source version of .NET first, because it already had that cross-platform capability built into it. So we had Mono and uh, a full framework uh, as our CLRs. Um, and then at some point, we got the, the core CLR to come online um, to, to move the entire style to, to that 
that, that, that platform. That was 2014. We brought yep. the Core CLR online in 2014 when we actually, at the, that was the same time we open sourced all of .NET. Yep. And I so was it was say. actually part of an open source movement that we had where we took even .NET Framework, we open sourced all the code for that and the code for Core CLR uh, to, to The to runtime, the tooling, everything. Why would you all think it's a good idea to change the engine in the car while you were driving the car <laughs> on the freeway? It seemed like fun. <laughs> <laughs> It turns out it was pretty hard to do um, all at once. So I think trying to replace the, the MVC and like EF and the whole like all at once was the kind of the biggest hard thing to do. But after a while, the, the team like got used to it, and, and I think once we shipped the first version, it felt like we, we had an, a good purpose, um, a good purpose um, to, to do so. You know, one of the points there, David, I think it's really important is why did we do that? And yep. we were looking at how do we add features like dependency injection into .NET. But well, we couldn't change all of .NET anymore because it was there was too much of it out there, and, and so it gave us a chance to rethink yeah, after the after thing. ten years or so to yep. rethink and go. Well, if we were going to do it to support this or to support that, we would build it this way, and so it gave us a new yep. way to add all those new capabilities. Started off small, and then we expanded to to NuGet, to the tooling, to MS Build, to VS, and it just turned into this whole big thing, OmniSharp. It was kind of a cool ride. Absolutely. Well, in that spirit, in the spirit of always moving forward while you're moving forward, I guess, if that makes any sense, I want to talk about .NET 7 Preview 1. When are we going to get it? .NET 7 Preview this 1. Thursday, I think. Yes, maybe? this yeah. Thursday, oh, 217. Oh. <laughs> I think this is when we're announcing that. Right. So, yeah. announcement. Well, and it's important Yay. to remember that people can watch the commits. They can go on GitHub. So, if you want to see what's happening in the kitchen, so you want to burn your machine down. I'm kidding. Go and run the dailies, <laughs> right? But yep. yeah, Thursday it sounds like. Thursday. Yeah. Yep. No, we have a lot of people using the dailies. Actually, I think a lot, a few people on the Bing team are using our there. nightly builds. Yeah, because and it's that performance that they're trying to get. We have people, nightly. On, we have people on even crazier teams that we can't talk about in this <laughs> that, are, that are using those nightlies as well. Moving on. I'll see no. you know good. <laughs> so you know it's good. So what's going to be in .NET 7? What are some features we're excited to, one, to one see? One of the areas that I'm excited that we're exploring is, you know, we, we live in this new world of containers and Kubernetes, and we as the .NET team want to find ways to make it easier to containerize your applications. And so imagine, with .NET 7, you can just build a container right from our tools without requiring any third-party tools on the box. And so it's easy to go right from your code to a container to the cloud. I have this giant list of features that I um, printed out. That we need but to I talk about. Them, but <laughs> We're going to run out of time. AOT compilation, so being able to compile your application to a single binary is, is a thing that you, you could have done in C++ and Rust and Go, and now it's coming to, to, to .NET in full form in 7.0. So AOT, AOT ahead, ahead of time. time compilation. Not JIT, yeah, not just JIT. in time. Yep. We're okay. also going to improve the JIT so we can actually make performance improvements at runtime as well. So we're doing both at the same time. It's pretty cool. Um, we're going to support regular expressions with a source generator. So it'll be <laughs> much more optimized. Regex. 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 Yeah, that's <laughs> um, We're going to also be looking at supporting WASM and WASI. So today we have, um, we have Blazor. Um, and we're going to support running .NET applications on, web on WebAssembly, not in the browser. It's oh. a big future forward looking yeah. thing. Is that like an edge IoT an kind edge, of thing yeah. where you exactly. actually want to, maybe the, those devices don't actually run runtimes, they exactly. just run WebAssembly? Yeah. Well, people are talking about WASM, WASM on has the a cloud, runtime. Exactly. right? So if yeah. WASM's a runtime, you don't run the .NET runtime, you run .NET on the WASM runtime. Yep. That's pretty cool. That's Very pretty forward thinking. Um, C Sharp 11 has some pretty cool changes, some that people don't like. Um, there's a pretty big brouhaha about the, the null checking, no checking operation. Sorry um, about that. Pretty good features that <laughs> the, are coming the in C Sharp bang 11. Bang operator, um, this is going to be exciting. Bang, bang <laughs> operator, static abstract interfaces, um, generic attributes. Ethernet Core has a bunch of MVC improvements that have been long requested that we're actually going to do in 7.0. Mm. Um, authentication is going to be simplified. I can't say how, but it will be. I mean, we won't break anyone, so don't, don't worry about it. Um, we're going to have output caching, rate limiting, more performance stuff because it is .NET, right? Perfect our thing now. Um, Blazor will have multi-threading. Actually, I noticed that you've got <laughs> HTTP <laughs> 2 <laughs> and HTTP 3, 3 on there, right? HTTP 2 improvement, HTTP 3. Does that mean that my website's just going to get better? I don't have to necessarily do anything? For free. Excellent. All right. Like for free. And you're going to give me those expression trees in, in uh, C Sharp, right? Yeah, that's on here too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, we have web two crypto, pages of notes. Blazor hybrid, better authentication, EF, JSON results, bulk updates, value objects, they're all coming. And Maui's going to be awesome. <gasps> yeah, Maui. Absolutely. And Maui's going to be awesome. So Agreed. excited for that to come out. Awesome. So we have a video from the .NET team. You can sense our excitement for .NET 7 that will be released in November. Um, and right now, you can get .NET 6. Um, 
it was released last November, so we're doing that yearly thing. And it's free. And it's free. Um, and you can get Visual Studio 2022 to develop in both. So we have more uh, stories from the .NET team that we want to share next of how we use .NET to build, or how we built .NET with .NET, actually. Let's yeah, you can build all the things. <laughs> we can build all the things. And run the <laughs> .NET with .NET. Let's roll the tape. It's crazy how quickly .NET's evolved. 20 years is an amazing milestone. There's this whole community behind it and like this huge history of innovation. Like so many companies over the past 20 years built in this thing. That's so cool to have all the generations encapsulated within, within .NET. That this thing was made before some coders have been born and they're going to start .NET and have a great experience. And I continue to have a great experience. It's really worked out well. I mean, there's a really good story behind it all. I used it for the first time in, I was in college. I came on CDs with part of, you know, Visual Studio yeah. .NET. I used to be a C++ and Java developer. And in uh, 2000, I took my team to the professional developer conference where .NET was announced for the first time. And I remember we, we went and grabbed floppy disks that were under our chairs and started playing with it on our laptop. And I fell in love with it. Even in those early days, .NET was already quite the technology. I found this picture here. This watch runs .NET Compact Framework, as I recall. We built an experiment that was accepted by the European Space Agency to test how people react to um, stimuli. And that's a .NET C-sharp um, WinForms app that was running uh, suborbital space. And then out of that, Microsoft Research asked us to put it into things that moved. So we built a lightweight R2D2, and this was running an early preview of the CLR2 with genetics. And we took this big guy all across Europe. What happened to uh, R2D2? Nobody knows. These are the DVDs of Visual Studio 2005 and SQL Server 2005. It was a co-launch. Dang. You mean back in the day you actually got like official swag from like from launching something? Yeah. Instead of like, okay, yeah. here's a download code. One runtime to run them all. <laughs> the ring is made up of, I think it's all the source depot has, like all the source depot repositories that we used for, for source control. When we broke one million oh, yeah. requests per second in the official benchmark, we got a cake. I also have this set of wine helpers. So it goes with your glass, Mary. It goes with mine. Cheers. We did some pretty destructive stuff back in the day. The chair races, so see who could race your chair down the hallway as fast as you possibly could. The turnaround was the top of the stairwell. You have an elaborate prank. I bought a bunch of remote doorbells. A pound of M&M's. Balloons. Cricket bats. The squirrel of shame originally. We brought the goat in one of the back doors. But that was felt to be too negative, so it's changed to the squirrel of chain. I'm this pretty sure right. we caused the anti-goat policy. The <laughs> manatee in memory. <laughs> when I first joined the team, I got a mail that said the Roslyn team has achieved full coverage. And what he meant was they had covered the entirety of Kevin Pilch at that time, my manager's office with aluminum foil. This is why we all work from home now. I think that's a tradition of Microsoft in general, is <laughs> work hard, play hard. So a hoo ha <laughs> is Hunter Hanselman. Uh, a oh. hoo ha ha was Hunter Hanselman hack. At one point they did a goo hoo ha ha, which was got three <laughs> Hunter Hanselman hack. And we figured once we hit the easy button, then they couldn't stop us. I'm excited to see what people build with the platform. I'm excited to see how much faster it is to even just get started with a .NET project. People just want to get their work done. And whatever's standing in the way of that, that's what we fix. I can't wait to show all the new stuff that's coming soon, especially all the cross-platform things and Maui and Comet. All of the cloud native uh, development stories that we're building with things like gRPC and Orleans and SignalR and, and kind of the rest of the ASP.NET Core family of things. I'm personally excited about just the very close future of releasing Maui. It'll ship, you know, at the build conference later this year in RTM form. But I think really .NET 7 is going to be when, when, when the Maui tech is going to come together. And super exciting to me that you can build a single app in .NET that runs on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. And even cooler, you can take the cool Blazor tech that we have and embed it into that tech as well. So it can, your app can be a mix of, of native UI and web UI. I'm excited about the future of developer productivity. I'm super excited about continuing to support our enterprise developers with WinForms and having some great support for uh, high DPI monitors. It feels like we're just scratching the surface right now and there's endless possibilities. Just such an exciting future of how you can write more code to do whatever you want it to do. I was very happy and blessed to work with the many hundreds of people who made .NET 
and I'm still having fun and that's why I'm still here. Every single one of you watching or contributing has just really made .NET so special and really changed so many people's lives. So I'm just excited for the .NET community, the growth, and for all the amazing projects that are out there that make .NET so special. We're all in this together. Absolutely amazing to see. I loved it. And I think we got a special tweet while that was rolling. Yeah. What do we have over here on the board? Well, it, it looks like Guthrie went into the archives here. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know he was going to do this. He tweeted this design and computation book. He used to write everything down. And this is actually from 1998, February of 1998. And this is the original spec of what eventually became ASP.NET, which is fantastic for finding that. Thank you so much, sir. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. I love seeing this history of stuff. We have so many people sharing some amazing pictures and swag from back in the day. .NET is truly all about the community. <laughs> We're all coming in. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> .NET for the <laughs> .NET is truly all about the community, and we're so thankful for the last twenty years. Yeah, I just want to say, it's been a great twenty years, and here's to the next twenty years, folks. Yep. Cheers. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Happy twentieth birthday, .NET. 20 years ago, something called .NET hit the streets. The .NET community has just always been a great community to be a part of. What's your .NET story? 20 years later, I'm still working as a .NET developer. And it runs on this device. Welcome to the future. Woohoo!